all art is political, whether you want it to be or not. There was Vietnam and there was Korea and wars that we weren't sure were the right wars. Why write if you don't have anything to say? Art and politics have crossed over in many different forms, from theater to books to film and television. So why should comic books be any different? What comics do now and these days is quite enormous. I mean, it covers quite a, a, a range of subjects, um, some controversial subjects. I think it's a responsibility of a writer to be uh the cognizant of his time, you know? And that, you know, what's going on in the world around me should be making it into my work. People will take any idea they want from anything you write. You know, I've written stuff where I was trying to put forward an idea and people will read the opposite idea into it and fight to the death that the opposite idea is what you intended. A picture is worth a thousand words. The power of a visual symbol can speak volumes rallying a population behind an idea or a movement. The power of images with relationship to politics is a way of creating symbols that simplify, uh, that unite, uh, and that sort of function very much as propaganda. Uncle Sam is a prime example of that. Uh, this is a human being who is America. Uh, now, obviously, America is far more complex than one individual, but by creating this, this one unified symbol, you're able to steer people towards an ideal of what they should be, and thus you're able to kind of bring them into a line with what you want your citizenship to be. The intersection of comics and politics is inevitable. All art forms are political. Even the ones that seem to touch on no political issues at all are nevertheless political, if only because they're very conservative and they promote the standard values. They don't question them. Alan Moore pointed out in the past that the, the CIA discovered that the best way to put across any type of information is in comic strip form. And my take on that was that I think the comic strip form works so well is because it engages the two hemispheres of the brain at the same time. So you're getting your, your reading and you're taking an art and looking at images. So that's actually you get right and left are working at the same time. I think comics have a place as propaganda. When you have something uh, where there are clearly defined good guys and bad guys, like World War II, you want, you want to wave the flag. You want to say, well, look, we're fighting a really important war here. Uh, sometimes you range into that unfortunate racism of, of wartime propaganda. The racism of World War II propaganda, the paranoia of the Cold War, both examples of the power of comics in a negative light. But just because you're using comics as propaganda doesn't mean that you can't use that power for good. We did a story about Batman going over to a, a fictionalized country to rescue this little girl and he fails and she's killed by a landmine. Landmines are things about the size of a shoe polish can. Very often they're in bright plastic. You pick one up and you die or you lose a limb. The main victims are children. And the guy who heads the organization in America that uh, works against landmines told me it was the most effective piece of propaganda he'd ever had. Can't tell you how, how gratifying that is. While Batman was used to raise awareness of the landmine issue in North America, the U.S. Department of Defense and UNICEF teamed with DC Comics in a campaign that included instructional Superman and Wonder Woman books for children in landmine hotbeds, showing them what to do if they see a landmine. For better or worse, political events of the real world can't help but make it onto the pages of comics. But sometimes there are issues too big for even the world's mightiest mortals to handle. After 9-11, both Marvel and DC did books that were all about the superheroes dealing with 9-11. And my reaction was, in that world, 9-11 didn't happen. Uh, for one thing, there's time travel in that world. You know, you got the Fantastic Four, look out the window, the first tower blows, they hop in their time machine, 
They stop it. The Avengers catch the second jet. It doesn't happen. So you have to find a metaphor. And oddly enough, I mean, 10 years earlier, I had done the metaphor where one of the bad guys picked up the entire island of Manhattan and flew it out into space. And that gives you a metaphor for that kind of cosmic catastrophe. But you don't, I don't think they should address the real world issues directly. I think it should all be done through metaphor. Superhero characters are fine in their place, um, which is as basically adventure characters. And I think once you start treating them as if they're real, it lessens the reality that you're, the, the world of reality you're trying to put them in. Well, after 9-11, I thought a lot of comics were, were very awkward in dealing with it because they, the month before they dealt with the entire universe being destroyed. And the tragedy of 9-11 compared against what those characters prevented the previous month seemed kind of trivialized. The story Shadow Play, written by Alan Moore and published in the 1988 Eclipse comic, Brought to Light, told the history of the Central Intelligence Agency's involvement in real-world historical events. The story is told to us by a fictional retired agent represented by the icon of the American Eagle. Instead of taking the issues head on, some artists and writers approach politically charged events as metaphor tackling the issues of the day by hiding them in plain sight. There's a great comic running right now called DMZ. DMZ is completely, totally about the US war in Iraq. It's about embedded journalism. It's about the way that American media covers it. And the word Iraq is never mentioned in it. It doesn't happen in Iraq. It happens in New York City. DMZ is effectively brings the war abroad home. And I think it also kind of creates this sense of a trajectory of where the divisiveness in America could eventually lead to. Uh, DMZ portrays this revolution between people who don't like American warmongering policies and people who are kind of okay with it. Uh, and it reflects this ongoing civil tension that, I mean, is particularly haunting given that America has seen a civil war before. DMZ taps into that anxiety and sort of steer it towards the war in Iraq as it now exists. It's, it's genuinely haunting and genuinely shocking to see these things occurring on familiar turf, the sort of homeland, if you want to look at it in that way. Uh, and I think it creates a real sense of empathy for the people who are living in the actual war zones, or the actual demilitarized zones. Uh, and uh, it allows us to relate to them a lot more profoundly rather than just images of people screaming flashed across the TV news. Uh, all of a sudden we can put ourselves in their shoes. I think that's the real value of DMZ, is it, it sort of bridges these two cultures. He had been Superman's arch enemy for decades. In 2000, Lex Luthor made the leap from billionaire CEO of LexCorp to become the president of the United States of America. Although his administration didn't last very long, Lex's evolution from crazed mad scientist to head of state was a pivotal moment in the history of comics and politics. How does wrapping yourself in a flag affect you? And just what is a comics journalist? for Vendetta is the story of the confrontation between an anarchist and a police state. Set in an England of the future run by iron-fisted rulers, V, the book's main character, does his best to bring the government to its knees. V for Vendetta was one of the very earliest sustained projects that Alan Moore wrote. It was drawn by David Lloyd. It's you know, this future dystopia where everything is solved by the person who blows up the Houses of Parliament at the beginning of the story. The political nature of the story is something that's reflected everywhere. There's always, a, there's always a dictatorship. Unfortunately, there keep on being dictatorships wherever you are in the world. And if it's not Hitler, it's Stalin. If it's not them, it's Pol Pot and, uh, or what happened in Bosnia. It's on and on and on. And, uh, and I think the, the universal theme of a hero 
fighting fascism, Nazism, dictatorships is one of those universal things that people always respond to because somewhere it's always happening. There's a lot of negative associations with Guy Fox, but he's sort of found another life as this symbol of revolution uh, and rebellion and opposing the powers that be. Uh, and V taking up that mantle and, and sort of becoming that Guy Fox uh, gives the story a sense of continuity. V is not the first rebel. There have been rebels for a very, very long time. And it's this, this great tradition. Uh, and of course, he himself gives the Guy Fox mantle over at the end of the text, implying that this tradition is going to keep going and going and going. There will always be those who oppose the order that exists. A flag is a symbol loaded with meaning. Although it starts as just a piece of cloth, it eventually comes to represent what a country stands for. Now, what would a flag mean if it became a uniform? America is a little too interested in exploring its own national spirit. And so if you're, if you're interested in coming up with something to symbolize something that Americans are interested in, you come up with a living symbol of America. You come up with a Captain America wearing the flag. You come up with Liberty Bell. You come up with Uncle Sam. Comics very much have used uh, superhero figures to become icons. Uh, again, very similar to Uncle Sam and John Bull, except here you're dressing them in tights. Uh, and traditionally, their powers reflect certain themes and ideologies. Captain America's shield is a prime example of this, this, this vision of America as a great protector. Uh, but of course, the shield is also a weapon. I, I think he exists in superhero comics as the greatest example of American flag waving. He is literally the embodiment of the American flag, a title that he, he wields quite proudly. He's dressed like an American flag, he, he throws a shield that's got the stars and stripes on it, essentially. And his job, in a sense, is to be the superhero bearer of the American ideal. And of course, Captain Britain can fly, he's super strong, he sort of represents this, uh, I don't know, uh, relationship between the British self-perception uh, and the superhero world. Uh, I think by making the flag their symbol, you make the flag their identity. And when you do that, you are suggesting that this person is profoundly implicated in, let's say, the American identity, the British identity. We made our icons part of history, so we're still fascinated with them. We created these icons just for entertainment value, but people, you know, Paul Bunyan's been there for a long time, Uncle Sam has been an icon, and, and uh, we identify with, I don't know, America more than anything. Look, we have to have a Burger King. Well, the introduction of Captain America punching Hitler was really just empowerment to this American ideal. The American people as a whole we would all love to punch Hitler. So why not have the symbol of America do it for you? Uh, now, of course, uh, we've seen this in comics before. I mean, Superman, in one of his earliest adventures, actually snatches Hitler and uh, Joseph Stalin and brings them before a world court. Uh, so it, it does exist as a tradition. It, it's a way of sort of involving heroes in the real world. Uh, and the average Joe sitting on a couch would love to punch Hitler in the face. So why not let him experience that vicariously through Captain America? Uh, and of course, the flag on Captain America's uniform uh, makes it really, really clear who that attack is from. This is America punching you in the face. As much as, you know, I write Captain America, who's, ra who's literally, you know, a star-spangled costume, I never really think of him that way. Like, I, I don't think of him as like the I'm, you know, America number one kind of hero. You talk to other writers who worked on the book and they say he embodies what America's supposed to be, not necessarily what America is. He's not some political yes man or he's not someone out, you know, just following orders. He's sort of the living embodiment of the American dream, which is, you know, that's an awful lot to be. I tried to get that feeling that he was always questioning and he was always doubting, am I doing the right thing and should I go along with the prevalent mood of the country or should I stick to my old ideals? And I thought that made him more interesting instead of just a guy who said, there's a bad guy, I'd better catch him. Not every flag draped character was a hero. Captain Nazi was introduced in Master Comics 21 in 1941 as a villain for Captain Marvel. Though Captain Nazi is pure evil, his actions led to the creation of Captain Marvel Jr., a new crusader against Captain Nazi and the Third Reich. From a man who wears the flag and defends America, 
to a man who virtually is America. When you write a comic, you try to get into the head of the character. Now, the head of the Uncle Sam and the Freedom Fighters is obviously the icon Uncle Sam. And Sam has a way of looking at America that, in a way, we all believe we can look at America. And even it's the same thing with Captain America and a lot of other characters, is that they believe in America, but they also see the corruption of America. And their attitude is, if I believe hard enough and if I set by example, then I can lead America and pull, pull them together and we can do anything. There's a series right now, uh, Uncle Sam and the Freedom Fighters, which is, again, interrogating this idea of, okay, what's a national symbol? What do we want a national symbol to be? Is a national symbol really a good thing? And it's playing around with this as its subtext. Its main text, of course, is, you know, people in brightly colored costumes going around and hitting each other because that's how you keep people's attention. You talk to younger kids and they feel like, well, why would you ever trust a politician? And it's a shame, you know? And these heroes speak volumes to the kids now because the heroes believe it and they're not corrupt. And we, we try to write the characters as, well, these are people that believe in what they're doing and believe in America. And, and uh, one of the things we try to do in the book is the more America believes in Sam and what he's saying, the stronger the character gets. That's why in sometimes we see Uncle Sam turn maybe 3,000 3, feet big and just grab airplanes out of the sky. It's like, that's how much we believe in him, that he can do anything. In The Ultimates, Mark Miller had every country after they saw Captain America it became like a super-powered arms race where every country had their own superhero. So it was like Captain Portugal and Captain Italy and, you know, Captain Russia and everything. So it, it is kind of interesting. I think it would probably, you know, be a lot more militaristic and a lot more nationalistic in real life if there were something like that in real life. <laughs> Occasionally, political comics come directly from the source, as seen by the story of Harry S. Truman, a propaganda tool published by the Democratic Party for the 1948 U.S. presidential election. The book details Truman's life with glowing praise, designed to appeal to adults and children alike. We can only wonder how many ballots were affected by a simple 16-page comic book. Comics and journalism are two words that people rarely use together but most people haven't met Joe Sacco. That's about to change. Political issues in comics range from the fantastic to the very real. Here's the essential reading on politics and comics. This is Comics 101. Dark Knight Returns is Frank Miller's take on the dystopian future of Batman and Gotham City. The book is definitely a reflection of the time in which it was written, examining some of the darkest points of the Reagan administration. Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons changed the face of superheroes for all time with their groundbreaking examination of the superhero and their effects on the real world in Watchmen. Through their eyes, we see how having superpowered beings would affect not only daily life, but the political landscape of the entire world. Joe Sacco has taken politics and comics out of the realm of fiction and into the realm of journalism. With his look at the conflict in Bosnia in the book Safe Area Garage Day, Joe Sacco believes the medium of comics has a vastly untapped potential. Comics are generally associated with fiction most often superheroes. But sometimes a comic can be something very different, like the work of Joe Sacco, one of the world's only comic book journalists. It's only really been in the last 20 years or so that there have been comics dealing actively with contemporary modern day politics, partly because there weren't really great comics reporters like Joe Sacco working until 15, 20 years ago. Being a comics journalist means you're melding the two media together, comics and journalism. And in my case, I look at it in a very sort of, uh, the journalism in a very classical sense. The idea is to go someplace, interview people, take notes, come back, and then to sit at my drawing table and uh, draw for whatever length of time it takes to uh, put a book together. 
I'm a little surprised that there hasn't been more work uh, of, the, of the kind of work that uh, Joe Sacco does in Palestine, although it might simply be that it is a hell of a lot of work. It's very difficult and very labor-intensive. But it would be great if there was a whole battalion of comics journalists following Joe Sacco's steps. I came from that genre, autobiography. It sort of informed the way I did my journalism. By putting myself in my journalistic work, it was a way of saying this is not an objective portrayal of these events. This is a subjective viewpoint. It's my viewpoint. And by drawing myself, that's almost like, it's like the, the personal pronoun I just walking around. So people know when they see it that it's, it's, they're seeing these issues through my eyes. He understands that what he's doing involves some distortion and he makes that a big part of the story that he's telling. The way that he visually distorts things even when he's reporting facts as facts. There have been times early on where, for example, Palestine, someone would say, well, how could you possibly talk about this issue, this important issue about the Israelis and the Palestinians in a comic book, it's ridiculous. If I handed someone a book on the Palestinians who isn't particularly interested in the subject, they're just gonna sort of push it away or say, yeah, I'll get to it sometime. There's something about a comic book that makes the people think it's gonna be easier to read. And it turns out you can get a lot of information in a comic book and a lot of hard information in a comic book. I'm actually a little bit surprised how little controversy there's been about Palestine. It might just be that, you know, Joe Sacco was even-handed and responsible enough that uh, people accepted it. Even if they didn't agree with it, they agreed that it was a, uh, a viewpoint that was uh, worth listening to. My standpoint is one that is sort of sympathetic to the historical dilemma of the Palestinians and nothing I saw made me feel any different. But I'm not trying to create like an objective book, I'm trying to create an honest one. So in, in the book Palestine, you'll see that Palestinians aren't necessarily angels, they're not. Some Palestinians are saying certain things that you, you know that if you portray what they're saying, it's gonna make them look bad. But the journalist in me says, if you hear it enough and it's sort of a trend, then it's, time to inject this into your story. I mean, you, you can't get around this. It's a really interesting approach. I love his comics. I think he's a brilliant, brilliant cartoonist. Uh, Palestine is an amazing book. Safe Area Garage does an amazing book. I really want to see what he does next. There's more to comic books than just Batmobiles and radioactive spiders. And there's definitely more of a link between comics and politics than appears at first glance. I mean, if Lex Luthor can make it to president in 2000, then who the hell knows? Thank <laughs> you.